Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinSwift.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. Jake Skolfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, the first guide of funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did. It's chock full of history, reviews, lists, personal stories. It's got everything you might want in there on the funk. Got to get a copy. Makes a great gift. Whether you're watching on YouTube or on funkandstuff.net to the video edition of this show or listening to the podcast audio version on iTunes or from other leading providers, as always, I thank you so very much for your continued interest and support in the program. Speaking of which, if you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe. You do so to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives. If you've already uh, done so yourself, spread the word. Encourage family and friends to sign up. That really helps support this program. That's so much appreciated. All right. Featured on this episode of Truth and Rhythm is legendary drummer, singer, and composer, James Diamond Williams of Dayton, Ohio's Funk Monsters, the Ohio Players. Coming from a musical family in which his mother played woodwinds and his father, quote, messed around with drums, unquote, Williams took 12 years of private lessons, played in all city orchestra, all city band, and high school marching band, and also studied at Kentucky State and at Miami University. Citing Zigaboo Modaleste, Hopefully I got that pronunciation right. The drummer of the meters as a big influence. He also points to Buddy Miles, Buddy Rich, and Gene Krupa as having impacted his style. Williams joined the Ohio Players in 1972, replacing Greg Webster behind the kit for the band's third and final Westbound album, 1973's Ecstasy. While the Ohio Players roots stretched back to the late 1950s, it wasn't until Funky Worm hit number one on the R&B chart in early 1973 that the group got a taste of major success. They would go on to notch four more chart toppers with two of those songs also making number one on the pop chart. A move to Mercury Records saw the band refining its sound to the signature millions would come to love. It was marked by stronger songwriting and pristine production, inventive arrangements, and the distinctive lead vocals of highly influential, one-of-a-kind talent, Leroy Sugarfoot Bonner, as well as his nimble guitar playing, also the falsetto singing of Diamond and William Billy Beck, as well as the latter's brilliant keyboard work, and of course, the former's progressive and impeccable drumming. What a magical sound it was. Beck proved to be the final piece to the puzzle, as he was the last to join, replacing enigmatic genius Walter Juni Morrison, who would go on to release eclectic solo albums and become a key contributor to Parliament Funkadelic during the late 1970s. Add to that intoxicating oral mix, Marshall Jones' rumbling bass, and horn players Ralph Pee Wee Middlebrooks, Marvin Merv Pierce, and band leader Clarence Satch Satchel, and you have the unmistakable magical funk perfection that was mid-1970s Ohio players. Essential to their indelible sound and consistency was how self-contained of a unit they were. Writing, arranging, producing, and performing everything themselves. As if that was not enough of a seduction, the Ohio players were also famous for their sexy and provocative album covers showing young ladies in various stages of undress. The Ohio players' creative and commercial peak took place from 1974 to 1977 when they unleashed gold or platinum selling albums, Skin Tight, Fire, Honey, Contradiction, and Angel. During that time, they were considered the biggest, or close to the biggest, funk or R&B band in the world, rivaled only by the likes of Earth, Wind and Fire, Problem of Funkadelic, War, Cool in the Game, the Isley Brothers, and the Commodores. So hot were the Ohio players that they had an entire episode of the concert TV series Midnight Special, which typically featured multiple artists dedicated solely to their performances. At this time, I got to break the script a little bit because 
The Ohio players are such a special band to me. They really shaped my youth and they shaped uh, my musical direction and my love of funk for a lifetime. And, you know, there's just a few acts that influenced me so much early on, like the Ohio players and Stephen Winder and Parliament Funkadelic. That I've got to go into some personal stories here of how they impacted my life. I recall when I was about 12 or 13, I was in seventh grade, um, just begun middle school, and I won a gift certificate at Warehouse Records. I think it was a five or ten dollar gift certificate. And I didn't know what to do with it. You know, I was gonna go buy an album. I had never bought my own album before. I had only gotten, you know, a few hand-me-downs through my family. My sister was in the music industry at the time, and I'd gotten a few records from her. And, you know, those were cool. But this was my first time going to buy my very own, going into the store. And I had a friend at the time, and his older brother had gotten the Ohio players. So I went to the store. I did not know the Ohio players at the time. I had not heard them. I had not heard of the group. But I saw that skin tight album cover. And, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, that helped influence me as well. As a, as a young man, just, you know, feeling his, his uh, testosterone starting to come in. And, uh, you know, my friend promised me, he said, you'll not be sorry. you got to get this one. So I did. At the time, Jive Turkey was an R&B hit. And that was, you know, the lead single. Skin Tight had not become a hit yet even. But soon, it would be, you know, constantly blasted uh, on the radio. And AM radio is pretty much what I listened to at the time. You know, like top 40 AM radio. Uh, KHJ in Los Angeles, and it soon became played in a regular rotation. But that album just opened my eyes, opened my eye, uh, uh, mind, and uh, you know the seven minutes of Skin Tight, the six or seven minutes of Jive Turkey, uh, Heaven Must Be Like This. Is anybody going to be saved with its gospel flavor? Man, I was hooked. And these the Skin Tight was such a beautiful album package. Not only was it really provocative, and um, you know eye-catching that way and, and stimulating in that way, but it opened up. It was a full gatefold and had all the brothers inside and with their nicknames and, you know, what they play and their astrological signs. And it set the whole template for the Ohio players at that time. And I was right there in the beginning, ground floor, diehard fan right away. So um, from that point on, you know, I got all of their albums the first day they came out. And um, I would have, as they became bigger, you know, I would have debates and arguments with uh, friends of mine who were, you know, sort of in the Earth, Wind, and Fire camp. And it became this like rivalry of the Ohio players versus Earth, Wind, and Fire. Who's the baddest? Who's the funkiest? And I always said the Ohio players were it. Well, Earth, Wind, and Fire was great, but they just were not quite as gritty and down and funky as the Ohio players. Plus, I didn't feel like they were quite as self-contained as the Ohio players. And I, I just love that element of it, that they did everything themselves. To me, it made them seem, uh, I don't know, more like geniuses, more mysterious. And, you know, I didn't even realize that they were from this, uh, you know, Dayton, Ohio. Um, of course, they were the Ohio players. But to me, growing up in Los Angeles, Ohio may as well have been the moon. I didn't know anything about it. I had never been outside of uh, Los Angeles at the time. And so um, really, you know, opening my eyes to the world were the Ohio players at the time. And I remember that Midnight Special uh, show too. It was incredible. It was, I think, an hour at least of just them doing their thing. And Fire was already out by then. <clears throat> and they did songs off that as well as Skin Tight. And, um, you know, we didn't have the high fidelity television then. It, and I think I watched it probably on a, you know, clunky colored TV. I think it was colored by black and white even. And I recorded it off the TV through the little speaker onto a mono cassette recorder. And that's how desperate I was for the Ohio players. And I played that, you know, crummy sounding cassette with the with the hum on it uh, from recording off the TV all the time just to have the extra Ohio players live. 
Um, and speaking of live, I was fortunate enough to see the Ohio players several times as a teenager. And, you know, as I've done with so much music, I tried to hook anybody I could into uh, what I thought was great music that they would also enjoy. And so I was, you know, such a promoter of the Ohio players. And I had, you know, an interesting group of friends at the time. But I, a, a certain section of, of my friends were these white kids in Santa Monica that um, were sort of oblivious to funk and, and that kind of music. But I would convert them. I would turn them on to it. And I would turn them off of the rock that they maybe they're listening to or the pop and turn them on to the Ohio players. And so I also would drag them uh, or get them hooked and, and have them go with me to concerts. And, you know, a few of the times I can share with you that I saw the Ohio players once, I think the first time was the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, which is, you know, for a 13, 14 year old kid, it's a little, it was a little dicey going there. It wasn't the greatest neighborhood. And so we, none of us could drive. So we had to take all these buses um, from the west side of Los Angeles all the way into sort of the, the inner city where the Shrine Auditorium was. And um, I think it's been, you know, kind of gentrified and lifted up some since then. But at the time, it was a little dicey. And we took buses to go there. And, you know, the audience was other than us, 100% black. And everybody, uh, most of the people are really dressed up and we're just this group of, uh, you know, five or so white kids, uh, you know, kind of raggedy dressed and just there. And I mean, people gave us looks and uh, it was quite an experience, especially when the show ended, it ended close to midnight and we, we're out there in the middle of that area uh, late at night and the buses were no longer running. It was past when they would run. So we were stranded out there and none of us wanted to, you know, try to contact our parents and get them involved. So uh, for about a very uncomfortable, tense uh, hour or two, we were just out there on the street corner stuck trying to figure out how to get out of there. We eventually got a cab and I'm not proud to say at this point, but we got the cab. We all piled in there, and they, they took us back to Santa Monica, and we would had no money. So we turned out of that cab and, uh, and left the cab driver high and dry. So not proud of that story, but it's an amazing memory. And, and that night, we all slept at a friend's house whose parents were out of town, and uh, we got a little inebriated, and uh, it was all quite an experience, but all centering around the Ohio players. Also saw the Ohio players at the Pan uh, Pasadena Civic Auditorium a year or two later, and that was another unforgettable show, and it's kind of a similar experience where I dragged friends to it, and we were really the only, you know, Caucasian faces there. You know, I mean, that's another thing about the Ohio players, because they were so true and so funky and and they really uh, carried that, that core black uh, audience, um, much like part of my Funkadelic did at the time. Whereas uh, an Earth, Wind & Fire, Commodores, I think had a little more crossover. It was kind of surprising with the Ohio players having two number one hits in Fire and Love Roller Coaster that they didn't have more white folks coming out to see them, but that's just the way it was, at least in Los Angeles. But that um, show at the Pasadena Civic also featured Side Effect, which was a really cool opening act, enjoyed them. And at that time, the Ohio players also had their dancers with them. So their uh, locking dancers would come out, and I think they came out during FOP, and they would like cut it up and do their lock uh, locking, and it was, it was great, it was so much fun. The last time I'll share with you that I saw the Ohio players was at the Roxy Theater in Hollywood. By this point, 1978, the Ohio players' um, popularity, unfortunately, quickly sort of ebbed and, and went down. Um, to me, I thought they, you know, received uh, less support from their label, less promotion, uh, but also the songs weren't weren't quite as good. You got to admit that. And there was apparently things going on inside the band: uh, drugs, friction, different things going on. So um, they came out with a song called Funkonauts and an album called Jazzy Lady, um, which I have here. There's uh, that one, 78. And um, 
course, at the time I had all these in vinyl. I gave away all my vinyl at one point and traded for CDs, and I'm very sad about that. But um, anyway, saw them at the Roxy in Hollywood. That's a fantastic venue. It's only like 500 seats. Saw so many great shows there over the years, and this was one of them. And um, took one friend, went with one friend of mine. We sat down. Um, it was general seating. So first come, first serve, and there's tables and seats that lead right up to the stage. We sat right in the front row, and we're right under the Ohio players right there in a small venue. It was incredible. And what really made it especially amazing, they would do two sets, often two shows, an early show and a late show. We just said, you know what? When they cleared out from the first show, let's just hang around and just see if they kick us out. And we did that. And they did not kick us out. So we got to stay for both shows. And I remember um, Merv, a uh, trumpet player on horns, was right over us. And um, he was kind of giving us a look like, you know, weren't you white boys here the last show? What is going on here? So it was pretty fun and funny. Um, actually, I'm going to also share one more time I saw them live. And this is the final time I'll share. This was many years later. About 10 years later, 1988, when they really tried to come back, and they came out with this album called Back. Uh, Sugar got back together with uh, Diamond and Billy um, and Chet, but they didn't have the horns. No horns, which, you know, really didn't make it quite the same. And they did a show at The Strand in Los Angeles, which is another small club in the uh, Redondo Beach area of California, Southern California. And I went to that as well. And it was a good show, but you know, the horns just were not the same. Um, they had a new guy on bass. Um, I think his name was uh, Dorch, Darwin Dorch. And I think he plays with them still today. And I brought the Fire album cover with me and it's right there on the wall behind me. And I, after the show, I got Sugarfoot to sign it. So that was a great, great thrill. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed these personal stories that I've interjected. You know, I cannot say enough about the Ohio players, how much I love those guys and that music and what it's meant to me and my soul for my life. So personal thank you to the Ohio players and so many of them Sugarfoot passed in 2016. So sad I could not get him on the show uh, in time. Uh, and um, Jones also passed away, I think a little bit later than that. So I missed him as well. So sad, I missed those guys. Satch uh, passed before then. The only ones that are left is is uh, Merv is still around. He was doing some business um, out of the music industry and more of a businessman. And working extensively down in the New Zealand and Australia regions. And I reached out to him quite a bit to try to get an interview with him. And we did communicate, but uh, couldn't work it out. And so we also have Billy Beck left and Chet and, of course, Diamond, who's on this program. Back to the uh, back to the script program here. So that Ohio players mid to late seventies wild ride slowed in a hurry. It's during the end of the decade. They just did one more album for Mercury Records, Jazz A Lady, and a final comeback attempt, Everybody Up, right there for Arista Records. They really failed to catch fire. Um, it it did not reignite their career. The players also released a soundtrack album. That was not mentioned, Mr. Mean, in uh, 1977. It's a Fred Williamson movie. Um, this, the movie uh, did not, was a blip on the radar, and this album did not do too well either. But it's very interesting because it's mostly instrumentals and uh, some tracks like Good Luck Charm with, uh, and Speakeasy with Great Flute Playing My Satch. It's really for the hardcore fan. During the Hot Players' glory years, their hits and classics included Skin Tight, Jive Turkey, Heaven Must Be Like This, Fire, I Want to Be Free, Running from the Devil, Smoke, Love Roller Coaster, Fop, Let's Love, Sweet Sticky Thing, Hoochie Coo, Far East Mississippi, Contradiction, Angel, Body Vibes, O-H-I-O, Merry Go Round, Funko Nuts, and Take the Funk Off, Fly. 
While Sugar continued to record under the Ohio player's name in the 1980s, have some of those covers here too, just a, a compilation from those years is that, which I recommend highly, 1980s years, because the albums weren't that great, but there were select songs on them that were pretty, pretty good. At the same time, Diamond Billy and guitarist Clarence Chet Willis, who had quietly joined the Ohio players in the latter part of the 70s, split her off into a new group called Shadow. Shadow released three albums for Electra Records between 1979 and 1981, none of which received much attention. But the final album, Shadows in the Streets, is worth seeking out for slick cuts like Born to Hustle and Sinister Way. That trio reunited with Sugar on an Ohio player's comeback album called Back in 1988, but it went largely unnoticed. Small label support, mediocre songs, and striving for an updated 1980s sound with keyboards replacing real horns did not help the project. That would be the group's final studio album to date, but varying lineups would keep bringing the Ohio player's unique brand of funk to stages for performances that continue to this day, led by Diamond and fellow surviving 1970s bandmates, Chet and Billy. The enduring influence, impact, and love of the Ohio players is evident throughout the music industry as well as popular culture. In addition to being sampled and referenced countless times by the hip hop community, rockers like the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Soundgarden have released cover versions of their songs, and OP music is often heard in films, TV shows, and commercials. Here, Diamond discusses his approach to drums, the secret sauce that made the Ohio players so special, unforgettable memories, band member talents and personalities, the group's catchy new single called Reset, and an impending album, and their busy tour schedule. Note that the video version of this episode only shows the host, there's truly, with Diamond on the phone as he declined to appear on camera. With that, let's fire it up for a roller coaster ride with sparkling legendary drummer of the Ohio Players, Mr. James Diamond Williams. I often have had the pleasure of introducing artists on this show of which I myself am a fan. But every now and then I get the thrill of welcoming a musical hero. That is the case today as gifted and innovative funk drummer James Diamond Williams joins Truth and Rhythm to discuss the mighty Ohio players. Diamond, how are you today? I'm absolutely wonderful, Scott. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate that, man. What's going on? Hey, uh, you know, all power to you, Diamond. Um, I thank you for all the great music you've given myself and our viewers over the years. Well, we've been very blessed in our lives. We continue to be blessed. It's not like it stopped for us, Scott, but I thank you so much for you, for, for, for being appreciative of something that's um, as a gift we had to give, and, and that's how we look at it. So thank you once again. Fantastic. And where are you coming to us from today, Diamond? Where am I at? Yeah. I'm sitting in Dayton, Ohio. I'm actually in my game room in my house, sitting in my game room. It's kind of quiet right now in here, Scott. But, uh, uh, so I'm in Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> well, you know, um, of course, we're on the phone so you can't see. But you should know that in my uh, wall of fame here that's behind me for all of these shows, uh, right up there prominent is the signed Fire album cover. Uh, signed by Sugar um, many years ago. So that's uh, one of the gems on my wall of fame here. Well, thank you very much. I got a few gems on my wall, too, one of which might be one of those platinum albums, uh, Scott. But uh, <laughs> you, you won't be able to see that either. It's sitting around me as, as we speak, likewise. But go right ahead. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So I want to uh, go back and talk a little bit, Diamond, about um, – 1973, around that era when you and, and Billy and, you know, some new blood kind of came into the group and there was a transition, you know, from Westbound to Mercury. The sound changed quite a bit and you guys had such instant success at Mercury. I just wanted to get your take on, you know, how you sort of formulated that new sound that came out of the gate just so polished and great. Well, there was, as you mentioned, Scott, there was a transition there. 
Okay, my first album with with the Ohio Players when I got in the, in the group was the Ecstasy album, which actually uh, was actually the last album on Westbound, and that was between seventy two and seventy three. That album, as as you mentioned, had similar Ohio Players old sounds, background vocals, and the likes. Uh, but upon um, Billy Beck getting with the group, the transition of Jimmy Morrison leaving out and Billy Beck coming in the group. It added other other ideas uh, along, you know, with me being in there. We added other rhythms, I, rock rhythm ideas. One, one thing that, uh, if, you, if you know, the early Ohio players, the, the drummer that preceded me, his name was Greg Webster, he played more of a shuffle. Every, every song, he played a shuffle beat. I was kind of, uh, I was kind of, uh, uh, musically instructed and had 12 years of private lessons also in the orchestra band and, and played, uh, jazz as, as an early kid. My dad was, uh, in, involved in music, loved music. My mom played in high school and, and growing up, she played reeds and she played all the reeds from clarinet to, to bassoon and oboe in high school or whatever. So I was, I was involved with music. So we brought that musicality to the band. Billy Beck and myself brought it to the band along with Sugarfoot, who was just an absolutely big genius, uh, a writer, uh, guitarist, singer. Um, and the three of us more or less correlated the music direction of where the Ohio players went. And do you kind of remember when you first came up with that sort of signature sound of the high falsetto background vocals and, of course, Sugar up front and and the rhythms, but you you just got that balance so great, right? Right at the beginning with that skin tight album. Yeah, again, that was that was really back to myself with the high background vocals. Um, sometimes they're higher than I ever imagined. Today, <laughs> guy was like, "How can be heck?" <laughs> you know, but <laughs> we didn't get to go as high as as those background vocals did some forty years ago, even today. But uh, yeah, the background vocal thing was all Billy Beck and myself. And Sugarfoot, of course, with that signature, you know, all girl and all that stuff that he would throw in and, and his, his vibe that he had. Was, and, you know, it was quite a huge. And how did you uh, generally come up with those vocal arrangements? You know, everything we did, Scott, was, uh, you know, pretty much, you know, uh, on the run. You know, on the run. The band was very busy at that time. Doing the Skin Tight album in particular, uh, doing part of the Skin Tight album, because we were in a transition, <laughs> uh, excuse me, going from Westbound again to, to Mercury, and they wanted to hear something from us right away. And we didn't have anything from the new band that we could present to them. So at that time, we were playing nightclubs and stuff like that in different areas. And at the, the time we were trying to come up with these ideas, we were playing in Buffalo, New York at a place called the Cotton Club in Buffalo, New York. And we were playing at night on the weekend, and Scott, we were flying into Chicago, the three of us, Billy Beck, Chet, and, and um, I mean, uh, Billy Beck, Sugarfoot, and myself, were flying into Chicago and finishing up the tracks during the day. Flying back to Buffalo, New York, doing a gig at night at the club, and then flying back in the morning to Chicago to work on tracks. <laughs> it was that kind of uh, schedule. Uh, and when I say on the go, I mean, just, you know, just, you know, some of the, the best stuff that you'll come up with is when you have a time limit to do it. And, um, and that's just exactly how it was. Wow. I bet you look back and think, man, how did we pull that off? So much, so much energy and so much creativity. Amazing. Yeah, we, uh, again, Scott, we were very blessed. We, uh, one thing I tell you we did do was, which again, was a little bit unusual. As of course you know this. Heck, you you've been involved. You write about this. You got a program about it. The the skin tight album was one of the things where we decided if we're gonna get played on the radio, we're gonna have them radio guys play as long as as, as they want to. So we wrote long groups. We were famous at that time for writing long groups. Skin tight was a seven minute group. That meant that you had to play that dag off that in the studio for seven minutes without a mistake, hopefully. And all of that was conceptual to the point where we said, you know, again, if, you know, why stop at three and a half minutes? Why write a song, you know, even on the album for three and a half, four minutes? If you can get radio, if you can get them guys to drop that knee on this track 
and you can have radio and airplay for seven and a half minutes, why not? So, <laughs> few of those albums had conceptual long tracks, and they were called grooves, man. The people got into playing grooves. It wasn't the first time somebody had done that. Heck, Donnie Hathaway did it on one of his tracks, and some other people that does likewise, but Ohio players wanted that, that with that attitude. Well, for those of us like myself that uh, couldn't get enough of skin tight, that was still about 10 minutes too short, I got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you say on the other side of the studio, Scott, okay? Yeah, yeah. In the drum loop area, it is a, it is a uh, place in skin tight after about five minutes, and Sugarfoot says, uh, go for a diamond, I play a pickup, and I, when I come out in a pickup, Scott, just for you and me to know, there's a mistake that I make, because I come out and I play the rhythm, as it should have been played normally, and then I turned the rhythm back around. That was a mistake in there, and that's one that I kind of changed around and came back within four measures to put it back in rhythm. After you hear this, this drum pickup where I go around the drums, you'll hear that the, the rhythm, the rhythm kind of switches right there. Then it goes back, and that's one of the things that I said, uh, guys, just keep, keep playing because we're five, six minutes into the track, we'll fix it. And I did, right on the spot. You'll hear it now and your people will be aware of it. Okay? <laughs> wow, we'll definitely listen listen for that. Um, <laughs> so uh, Fire, of course, came just so fast on the heels. I mean, the same calendar year, 74, Fire was out, took you guys to the stratosphere, number one hit. Um, is there anything you remember in particular about that track, Fire, uh, creating that um, – you can share with us. I mean, did it just leap off immediately when you guys kind of finished it? Stevie Wonder to kind of help name that track. We was in a, a motel with uh, Stevie on in LA. He was working on Intervisions, he was working on Fire. Tiny did we know it was Fire. We had done the rhythm track to it, and Stevie and I would play certain things that we were working on in the studio back and forth. And when I played this rhythm track that now is called Fire, he said, you could call this track anything. He said, you could call it rock stubble. He said, this track is so hot, you could call this track anything. He said, and, and when the phrase came up so hot, it was like, this is fire. This is what we're going to name this track, fire. Thank you, Stevie. And that's the story. <laughs> well, I mean, and this music, again, I mean, it all holds up so well today because you guys, I mean, you stuck to your 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 principles musically, you know, I don't think that you compromised almost, almost never. And so that's a big reason I think why it's endured so much and why your fans have stuck with you. So, so much credit to you guys for that. Thank you. And once again, I say we were kind of headstrong. We thought we were invincible. Okay. We thought we could do it all. And we made a, a semi great attempt at doing that, meaning producing it and directing it and writing it and having along with the Playboy photographers and models conceptually designed album covers of which we were working on. We kind of had hands on uh, with everything. We thought we could manipulate and, and direct it and, and do it all ourselves. Of course, at that time, Motown was real big and Motown had a history of being able to uh, kind of design their arts. And we didn't want to be under that kind of tutelage, although they did a very fine job, I must admit. Um, but we were kind of a band at that time that was breaking out, breaking out from the doo walkers, you know, with the Charlotte, they are finally stylistic, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. We were part of the new band era where it was, you know, function, it was Commodores, it was Cool in the Game, it was Blue Birth, it was Ohio Players, it was bands. Of course, it was Tower of Power and those bands like, up likewise. But um, we were the era of bands. And so as a band, we did the singing, we did the playing, we did the everything, the writing and the arrangement, as I mentioned. And, and so, you know, we're, we're very fortunate how it worked out for us. Amen. And I mean, when I grew up looking at those covers and saw those credits were for the band, I mean, that just made me, you know, so much more. I don't know. It, I think, you know, for a vision to really come to full fruition, you kind of need that. Um, and so... That's why it works so well, I think. Um, Diamond, can you talk to us a little bit about I Want to Be Free on that same Fire album? I mean, so beloved, such a unique ballad, and you're drumming on it, Sugar Out Front. Um, how'd you come up with that? 
when we were writing that track shot, we were practicing as we often, you know, would, you know would do at that time. We would play musically. We're playing the track in the studio. We're working on the track, and we're playing the, the basic verse to the track and the hook to the track, and you know, that and that day and, and, and whatever it to the track, and we're playing that, and and we're and so you know, it's coming up where it's, and it's like, it's like, well, what are we gonna do here? You know, we came up with musically. We're playing that, and she was like, that down you take the four. It's like what? He said, yeah, in fact, start it off with the four, and then we'll come into the track from there. It's like, well, yeah, Scott, I don't have a problem with taking take the four. Anytime somebody's going to give it to me, it's like, okay. So, but it is quite, quite musically unusual for a ballad to be written that starts with a drum solo, flaring and, and hitting drums and smashing and crashing cymbals. And then it breaks down to a drum stuff into to a ballad. Very musically unusual. So yeah, it's one of those unique uh, music pieces that, you know, we kind of pride ourselves in. Uh, the band did not and, and does not even today we're writing, you know, an album, a new album called Reset. And we're going all different musical directions. As as the band all oftentimes did. I mean, yeah, girls, you mentioned them. You know, I want to be free. But how unusual is the song Contradiction musically? How unusual, and even for a subject matter, how unusual is the song uh, uh, Little Lady Maria musically? How unusual is that? I mean, the castanets and the, the maracas and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, it was not just about funk music or pop music. It, it's just about good music. And what Ohio players try to aspire, aspire to do is just play good music, and in some some kind of way, I think we were able to do that, Scott, because time has told us that, you know, we're still being played, people still enjoy it, you know, I'm able to go out and witness that and see that, you know, uh, periodically during the year, many times, with, with many people, which is totally a blessing, and uh, to still be on advertisements such as, you know, Toyota and Jaguar Hills Kitchen and Papa John's Pizza playing, you know, fire and whatever, whatever. It's just totally a blessing. Every time I see it on the on, on TV, not only do I say cheating, but uh, <laughs> it's a it's a total blessing to, to be around and people still vibing off that music. It's just absolutely wonderful. Yeah, yeah, and 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 also on that same fire, I uh, the it's hell also opens with a nice uh, drum. Uh, it does. You too. It so, does. Yeah. But it certainly does. It all does likewise. You're right. Uh, for me, Diamond, you know, I don't know how you feel about it, but I feel like Honey was sort of like the absolute like zenith of your guys' uh, gelling. You know, I mean, it has everything that you guys did so well. Sweet Sticky Thing oh. is a masterpiece, I think. Um, do you remember anything about that track in particular? Yeah, again, you know, we was going off a little jazz vibe, you know, uh, and oftentimes the band would take a, a groove and we would play a groove and we'd say, okay, let's make this groove country. Let's make this groove reggae, the same groove. All right, let's make this, let's, let's put a shuffle with this groove. And we would play the groove in variations, rhythm variations, musically the same part, but rhythmically change it around to see just what fits the best. So we were, we were into this, you know, kind of jazzy vibe, you know, and say, oh, let's write this, this, this track with a little more jazz feel. And um, and so, you know, the subject matter, yeah, I don't have to tell you what Sweet Sticky Thing is. I mean, uh, and honey, I mean, are, are you kidding me? The band always wrote about love. And, and so Sweet Sticky Thing is what Sweet Sticky Thing is to you. I won't say that. <laughs> on your show what it is, but uh yeah it, it's a great song man i love playing that song it has a lot of variation you know it has of course a sea change and la da 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 la da da all of that and it goes off into a nice tag on guitar solo and and some other things we play it live on stage and uh and we have a good time with it every night and other people have, have covered it likewise you know my i have a good friend his name is alex bouillon and Alex Boo Young does a, a wonderful job of playing a sweet, sticky thing. I love to hear the rendition 
every time I get a chance, I go <laughs> to Alex and I get a little envious that we did what he did. <laughs> a little bit like he did. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. It, it was great to, to write. It's, it's good to hear. Yeah. And FOP, you know, I was so impressed because Fire was such a hard track. And you guys came back on the next record, and I thought FOP was even harder than Fire, um, where a lot of bands might try to just repeat it or go softer. You just kept bringing it. and um, But a lot of people still ask, Diamond, what is fopping? <laughs> oh, they don't ask that? Oh, no, no. Scott, they can't ask that. Listen, fop last night like I fopped indoors. Fop out whatever, whatever. You know, fop, fop it, okay? Now, you just listen to the words. You just listen to the words, okay? Now, fop is a four-letter word. Okay? <laughs> now, if you can think of another, now this is just use your imagination. Think of another four letter word, and it is not funk. Funk, <laughs> it is close to it. Now, I'm not going to give you the answer. Choose on, upon yourself what the answer might be. But popping, just popping, people popping. I'll tell you another, here's another here's a little key phrase and clue. How do people make people? They pop. <laughs> All right, I think we finally clarified. Some people thought it was just a dance, so, but, okay. Um, so you mentioned Contradiction, and I want to mention another track on that record that you didn't, that I think maybe has the, possibly the most, I don't know if I want to say intense, but just, just driving a relentless groove is Hoochie Koo. Um, and you're, dr yeah. you're drumming on that with the guitar riff. Incredible. We play that. Also, Scott, you know, on our show, it's a, that you, you don't consider that a, a funky track, but it's low down. You know how low down it is? It's just, I don't, that's not, it's not a musical category, but it's just low down. You know, it's just like Jive Turkey is a low down track, just low down, Jive Turkey. But the, but Hoochie Goo is different. It's got a different little snare drum beat in it. It's got a different little, a little glitch to the hitch and uh and like the, and you mentioned the guitars in there is just incredible and uh we have a good time playing <laughs> likewise every night yeah hoochie coo now what does that mean scott hoochie coo tell me i can use my imagination I think. <laughs> you, okay okay all right all right man. yeah you pass that test all right here we go uh and just the dr the, the drum breakdown on that i mean oh just fantastic um thank you then uh i want to mention on angel body vibes another sort of uh, stretched out kind of epic track where you guys just you know allowed it to breathe and develop and go to different places is there anything you can share about body vibes body vibes is that you know we were really musically we were in a different place there things were happening with us to us and around us and the vibes, the body vibes. Listen, everything in music, as far as we're concerned, was either re a reflection of what we saw or a reflection of how we felt. And we were feeling vibes of things not being right in our lives at that time. Um, of course, you know, I mean, we had been around the world several times by then. Uh, we had been number one several times by then. Um, at that time, I thought, Scott, I thought in my life, I said, well, if I had three platinum albums in a row, <clears throat> no band has ever done that yet. And I'm looking at three right now on my wall. Um, but we were, at, we were at a different time. And, but the vibes, the body vibes was wrong. Something, something about the body vibes. And, and our music was transitioning then. Um, some music I listened to that, that we, we wrote during a certain period some some music i don't listen to anymore uh and it's for a reason um but body vibes was one of those songs and and after that you know everybody up was another song that was like an eh, album that was just eh, whatever but uh that was a transition for us at that time scott what uh it wasn't too long after that when um the band kind of splintered um what 
what was the reason for breaking up, if you can put it in a nutshell? If I put it in a nutshell, this too shall pass. Whatever that is, this too shall pass. Uh, you only stay uh, on top for a certain period of time. And it's, it's, it's time, you know, at that point, I put it very, you know, succinctly that uh, we had stayed together for a long time, Scott. You know, we had been brothers, we had lived longer together than than with my wife that I'm still with after 52 years, okay? And um, so it was just time for us to breathe, you know, and go different directions and to and see who wanted to stay in the business and didn't want to stay in the business and what some people wanted to do other things quite naturally. And uh, it gave us time to to, uh, to get a chance to do some of those things. And um, so, you know, everything... Everything comes to not an end, but it, it you know it has a chance of, of moving and and uh, you know evolving in a different direction. So that that that's what we did. I remember getting a little like angry though, um, like in the latter part of the seventies. I felt like maybe Mercury wasn't supporting you guys as well as they had early on. Do you feel that way at all, or was I just projecting that? You you were in our corner, but it. it they, they did a great job, guys. Okay, I mean, you can get off them a little bit. They were okay with us, all right? Fair enough. So you mentioned Sugar, uh, the phenomenal talent. Is there anything else you can share with us about Sugar, you know, as as a, as a person, as, as a spiritual force in the group? Yeah, it was like, uh, you know, they're, they're, as far as I'm concerned, you know, they're only being one of certain individuals that have come and gone. I'll give you an example. There'll only be one Aretha Franklin. Okay? The queen is, is not with us anymore physically on this earth. And uh, she, she, you know, we played her holiday party at her house. We had the pleasure of doing that, Scott. It was like the most wonderful day in my life. I had my daughter in her kitchen cooking oxtails with Aretha Franklin. Are you kidding me? And I was all over her house looking at all her awards, and she gave me permission to do so. Are you kidding me? So there will only be one Aretha Franklin. There will be other people that will emulate her. One. There will only be one Sugar Franklin. Okay? One. Uh, I mean, there will only be one, you know, Jimmy Hendrix. You know, there will be only one... Uh, uh, you know, um, that's Domino and certain people like this. There will only be one. And so, therefore, uh, Sugarfoot was very unusual uh, and genius, as all of those artists were and are. And uh, he was a lyricist, uh, tremendous lyricist, and, uh, and had ideas, music ideas, and had the uh, availability to play, all of which he had an understanding of. Um, but, you know, he, he surrounded himself, iron sharp as an iron, and here we were, Billy back to myself with some sharp knives ourselves. And as I mentioned, Scott, kind of, the three of us, along with it took everybody else, but the three of us kind of orchestrated everything that there that you listened to in the years. And uh, two of us, along with, with Chet, who uh, joined the band in about 76, mm, um, are the three original members that are with the band today. And we uh, went on during that period of time where people were were aspiring to do some other things. We, uh, we aspired to do, do something uh, called a group called Shadow. And Shadow was Billy Beck, Chad, and myself. And Shadow is, is the flagship right now, for the most part, of the Ohio players, as we were when, when we got back with the band in 83 and 84. And, and we have the three of us been with the band since. So that's where we are. Yeah, I definitely picked up all those Shadow Records, too. I think three of them you guys did. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, what is your favorite Ohio Players album and song and why? Uh, I'd say the next one, and I <laughs> have yet to write it. Okay. Is, is there a track, though, from the 70s that might be – for you know something about it that really just does it for you 
got if you got any kids, that's like asking you which kid is your favorite. I, I kind of <laughs> like them all, you know. I uh, I don't have any favorites. And, you know, anything that we put out, I like. Or you didn't hear, okay? Um, so I, I like them all. I have no favorites. I enjoy them all musically. They're all very well. That's very diplomatic. Are you running for office in Dayton? <laughs> <laughs> I I am not, but. I assure you, I am not. <laughs> uh, do you think over the years Ohio players have gotten the respect and credit that they deserve? I think we have. You know, you get what you deserve. You get what you deserve, and if you don't get it, say nothing. You know, um, there's so many things that I have got. You know, I, I, I tend to forget the things that I've lost, all right? And if I, I didn't get it, I know I, I, I don't have any memory of it. So, um, I, uh, I I don't worry about or care about, for the most part, the things that we don't get. And so many things that we have gotten, it oversees all, all the other things that I have not gotten, and, uh, of which I, I truly don't care about, for the most part. You mentioned that Aretha Franklin memory, which just must have been something else. Is there another show uh, that you can remember, just a story from the road, maybe from back in the 70s, that just stands out for whatever reason? Uh, we did we did about uh, 10 or so shows with Marvin Gaye. When Marvin Gaye was crossing the country and he was doing this video live, you might have seen Marvin Gaye across the United States at that time. We were opening up for Marvin Gaye. That's another one of them individuals who could only be one, like Luther Vandross. Yeah. Listen, Marvin Gaye was, uh, was huge. And I knew Marvin Gaye was huge. You know, I had, come on, I was used to that. We, we were kind of big at that time. <laughs> we had written a lot of records, okay? And, we, and for us to be on that show, I mean, you know, we've done a lot of shows. So we, we started coming to shows, Scott, and I remember this. I remember saying, a number of ambulances and paramedics and, you know, fire trucks and all that kind of stuff parked at the arena. I, I'm seeing this after a couple of shows. I said, what is all of this? All these, you know, emergency vehicles that we get. We never had this before. We have a couple or whatever. But why is it 10 or 15 of these things out here? What's going on here? They said, Marvin, when he comes out, he always, people, a number of people always pass out. I said, what? So are you kidding me? So, I had never seen his show. I mean, not close up. Maybe I'd seen Marvin Gaye, maybe on TV. So after, after we come off stage, I go out and I'm on the side of the stage and I watch Marvin come out and he just opens his arms, Scott, and people start passing out, panting the flying, people passing out, going, I said, are you kidding me? Incredible. Then he opened his mouth. <laughs> the man never sang a flat note in his life. I worked with Leon Ware, who did some work with us on that Shadow album that you talked about. Leon wrote some songs to Marvin. said, never sang a flat note in his life. The man was incredible. Are you kidding me? Yes. That that was a just a, a memorable situation. Marvin Gaye. I, I, I went in front of my mirrors and tried to open my arms like he opened his arms. It didn't work, Scott. I mean, just opening his arms, people started to pass out. I said, are you kidding me? So, you know, that would be one. The other one would just as, as top of the head would be when we opened up the Superdome. Uh, we were the first uh, show in the Superdome, along with, of course, the Jackson 5. And the Jackson 5 with uh, Michael Jackson at that time, they were huge. And uh, we packed that 80 or 90,000, which was one of the biggest places you could play at that time. We packed it for the first time. So those are a couple. Wow. What, do you remember about what year the Superdome was? I couldn't kill you, Scott. I, don't, mm -hmm. I really don't know. Of course, it's changed its name now. But, yeah, we opened that last call up at the first show. Wow, awesome. Um, so you mentioned the uh, the new music uh, reset. Reset itself is a great track. Really enjoyed that. Uh, when might we hear more music? Well, you're gonna hear more music. We got some right now in the can that that we're finishing. I've got a few more, as I mentioned, which are gonna be my most favorite ones. Then we're gonna write, <laughs> and uh, then we're gonna get that album out and underway. Uh, 
Uh, we got some ideas. We, you know, the thing that was writing is you, you do it according to how you really feel, you know. And and we've gone around and we've you know looked at people and seen things that are going on. Of course, we're we're a product of what our environment is. So we're looking at political situations and all kinds of stuff, which is how we wrote Reset. Everybody needs. You know, we looked at it, it's like, hey, you know what? All of this jibber jabber back and forth. This this country needs to take a reset. And, but as you look at it in a romance type situation, of course, we always switch things around. And that's why we put the reset on like this girl that we just saw. And it looked like she hit the reset button because she looked so young. And that's what the song is written about. But uh, we got some other songs that, that are about what's going on. And, uh, as soon as we get it together, sir, you know, it's all in time. Fantastic. Look forward to that so much. And and you're doing uh, shows throughout the summer and throughout, you know, the year, I assume? Oh, my. Yeah, we're booked all the way until January of, uh, of the next year when we're doing Niagara Falls in January at a, at a casino there. But, yeah, we're, we're everywhere. We got a couple of days in Hawaii this year, some Blue Note Clubs. We're doing the uh, Ventura County Fair out in LA. Of course, we're doing a club called Yoshi's out there in Oakland. We're, um, we're, we're doing uh, York, Pennsylvania in a couple of weeks. We're at a big festival in York, Pennsylvania. And then we go down to Huntsville, Alabama, where the Ohio players are giving away music scholarships at HBCU schools because we're trying to get these kids to continue in performing music. And, and playing music and not get all caught up with this programming. But we want to keep where the public can continue to see artists performing music and loving that of which they're doing. And so we're giving away music scholarships to HBCU schools, and the first of which is in Huntsville, Alabama, like I mentioned. And so the band's quite busy. We're doing uh, casinos, we're doing a Hollywood casino, we're doing a jazz in Cincinnati. Uh, which is a big jazz club so here before we head to touring our wives. So, yeah, the band's busy. We, we do a, a club likewise called The Birchmere in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, and we're going back there in December. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're moving around, Scott. That's fantastic. When you get to a point where you can become as much about, you know, uh, educating and and uh, you know illuminating young minds to real music as well as entertaining. That's right. That's our that's our goal. Some some of which is our goal right now is to kind of pass this, this torch on to a point um, and and try to educate and inspire you know kids to continue to stay in this business as much as it's changing. Perhaps they can tell me a lot about what's going on. God, it's going to be a reciprocal situation where. Hopefully, they'll learn a little bit from, from us, and we can learn a little bit from them, you know. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're, we're involved with that right now. What's the best way for everybody to keep in touch with all things Ohio Players? Yeah, uh, you can go to our Facebook page, Ohio Players. You'll see that, that logo of that familiar woman. And, uh, and, and. You know, we have a PR firm, Jones and O'Malley, in which you have talked to out in LA that kind of monitors our, our, our Facebook page. And of course, I put some posts on there occasionally, but you can keep up with us on, on there. Fantastic. Diamond, uh, before I let you go, I have a final question. And that is looking back, what accomplishment or piece of work are you most proud of? What accomplishment or piece of work? I'll tell you what, Scott, I was. I was floored, flabbergasted, overwhelmed when about a year and a half or two years ago, I was looking at this article from Rolling Stones and they said the top 100 drummers of all time and every music category, every genre of music that has been written, they had their top 100, of course, and this is their opinion. And I'm looking through it and I'm going through 100. 99 and I'm freaking down and I'm not in the 90s. I get to the 80s and of course I'm not in the 80s. So I get to the 70s and it's like, oh Lord, 75 and I'm going down. And when I turn that page to 72, my picture pops up, Scott. My picture is a diamond with the Ohio players. It has this write up about how they thought I was unique with my rhythms or whatever, whatever. And I was like, knocked. Out 
I have never gotten <laughs> personalized license plates for my cars. And I've had a few cars, Scott. Uh, people put, uh, you know, I found the, you know, sports cars and the like. I never had a personalized plate that said Diamond Ohio Highway, whatever, whatever. My license plate now says number 72. I am most proud of just being in the mix of what they would consider the best drummers of all time. And that has floored me. Coincidentally, uh, I got in a band in 1972. Oh, so I have a stick bag. If you <laughs> see my stick bag, and if you go on my Facebook page, or the Ohio Players Facebook page, you'll see my stick bag on there. It is dolled up and jeweled up with a guy named Stevie Shockley. He's with Lake Size, who does this bag on jewel work on, on guitar straps. And I asked Steve, I said, Steve, you, you going to do some of my stick bag. So I went for a nice stick bag, a uh, leather stick bag, of course, and uh, and he jeweled it up for me. And it is amazing. And on that stick bag, it has number 72. And I get announced every night, and O.D. Mays, our keyboard player, announces me, and he grabs my stick, stick bag, and he tells the, of the story of the Rolling Stone situation. And... Out of everything that we've done, I think that, that makes me the most proud, um, just to be recognized, Scott. Yeah? And it's, you know, the top 100 drummers, and, and I have found myself being a part of which, and it, it, it's truly amazing. Wow, it's so well-deserved. Uh, you know, I it didn't escape you, but I was going to ask you if 72 was about the year you joined the group, and so that's so, like, perfect. Um but, uh, you know, in my mind, of course, 72 is not high enough, but I'm a little partial. <laughs> well, you know, Scott, I, I was happy, you know, I was happy with 72. I'm very comfortable with it. I think all things being true. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'll match everything in a few years. I, I happen to be 69 right now, but in a few years, maybe three, all those numbers will match. I'll be 72. I, yeah, I got the group in 72, and I am 72 ranked as far as the drum is concerned. So that would be a great year. That would be 2022 when that will happen. And that will be also uh, the year that will be the 50th year that I have been a part of the Ohio Players. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Wow. Well, Diamond, it's been so great talking to you. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me and our viewers. and. Just wish you so much more continued success and just keep it going, you know, for years to come. And personally, I hope you can get out to the Carolinas in the near future. But, uh, you know, congrats for all that's going on and thank you for all you've done. Well, if you hear about us being in the Carolinas, I think we are coming forward to somewhere. I don't know, but listen, if you hear about it, go on the Facebook page uh, and if you hear about it, you get in touch with me. You got this number. And uh, we'll make sure that we get a chance to meet each other. But I truly appreciate it. You know, this opportunity, you call me. I hope, hope the people that listen enjoy it. And uh, keep on listening to Scott. He's got a lot to say. I'll see you, and I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you so much, Diamond. Take good care. <laughs> All right. Bye. Goodbye. Okay, <clears throat> hey, hey. Back in studio at the Truth and Rhythm Mothership. Look, I hope I did not seem too starstruck. But I never imagined as a 13-year-old Ohio Players junkie growing up in Santa Monica, California, that one day I would meet, let alone befriend and interview funk heroes like Diamond, my favorite drummer of all time. I have been after him for a couple of years to do this interview because not only are he and Ohio players so close to my heart and soul, but Truth and Rhythm just would not be complete and comprehensive without the story of the greatest band of them all to emerge from the funk capital of the world, Dayton, Ohio. One of the reasons it took so long was Diamond preferred doing a phone rather than video interview. And I finally decided, as I have with a few others, that the artists and their stories are more important than the media format or presentation. So I relented and I'm glad I did because it was a great conversation and a lot of fun. He proved to be as precise in his responses as he always was pounding the skins. Big thanks again to James Diamond Williams. And as always, a big thank you to you, the viewer and listener of this show. Thank you so much for that support. Also, speaking of that, subscribe. If you haven't already done so, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives. Support the show. 
Do it through subscribing, also commenting. But share the love. Get friends and family to subscribe. Show these funk, R&B, and jazz artists that you love and appreciate the great works that they've given to all of us and all that they've meant in our lives. We're over 100 shows into Truth and Rhythm now, and the movement keeps growing. You know, got to keep that funk alive, baby. That's all there is to it. So much appreciated for the support. And write me, write Scott G at funkinstuff.net. Let me know what you like about the show, who else you might want to see on it. And just talk music. Let's shoot it around. You know, um, want to get your input. It's your show. So keep it coming. You will hear back from me quickly. I assure you that. And with that, as always, Scott Toucher G. School find signing off saying, keep on vibrating to the rhythm of the one.